Good morning. Welcome to Prayer Lakes Church. I'm glad to be here. How about you? We are uh, delighted that you're with us. We honestly mean this. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. Uh, you can worship here. You can look for God in this place. If we're waiting for everybody to get figure, things figured out and straightened up and their life perfect before they can come to church, then we're going to be an empty church. But this is what we do all across Iowa, and so we're delighted that you're joining us this morning. Hey, we get to welcome out a whole bunch of people who are watching online right now. Uh, we have Waterloo, Osage, and Grinnell. We've got our friends in New Hampton. We've got our friends in Washington. So let's welcome all of them in right now. We are glad you part of Prairie Lakes. Awesome. Cool. Second thing is this. Let's get our Bibles out. We always start with that. Part of our DNA is this, Bible. Uh, we believe it's God's Word. We think God speaks to us through the Word. And, and so uh, we just go to it. So get a Bible out. There's some on the chairs here at your campus. They might be at the end of the rows. Uh, pull out your phone if you'd like to. Use you version or, or something like that. Uh, but we are uh, 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 going to go to the Word. And I know some of you get a little nervous about this. Don't worry. I'll help you get where you're supposed to be. Second thing is this. Back of your bulletin, a great place for you to take notes, all right? So uh, the, especially in this series, uh, we're just covering a lot of, a lot of breadth with uh, this series. So it's really important, I think, that you follow along and take some notes so you can remember some things. So the ushers are coming down right now. If you don't have a pen, just get your hand up, and they'll get a pen to you um, and, and get, uh, get ready for that. All right. Hey, uh, let's just do a very quick um, kind of recap of what we're doing and, and why we're doing it here, Okay. So the first part of the summer, we we're, in this, we're in this whole series that they called The Plan this summer. In the first four weeks, this is the fourth week, it's all about putting it in motion, about what God did to put it in motion. And our whole goal with The Plan is this, that we can help tie the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Because there's a whole bunch of us that like go, man, I, I just, I just I, the New Testament, okay, yeah, I, I see it and I can read it. But when it comes to the Old Testament, it's like crazy. There's stuff in there I don't understand. And why did God act the way that he did? And why, did, why was it like that? And so what we're doing is, is trying to pull those two together. So at the end of the summer, here's what we really desire is that God is bigger for you, that you've expanded on who God is, that he's kind of blown out the borders that you've put on him. And, and that's our goal. And we always want to be asking this, what's your next step? What's your next step? What's your next step with God? Now, for some of you, you know, it might be just, um, uh, you know, I just need to get in the Word more regularly. For some of you, it's, it's, I need to start tithing. For some of you, I need to start serving. For some of you, it's, hey, I've got some neighbors I know I'm supposed to get after, and I haven't been. But all of this is designed, when God gets bigger, then He pushes you to take next steps of obedience. So, so be open and ready for that. Hey, one, not, this isn't a side note, but just a reminder, you guys. Hey, um, we have uh, been given a really great opportunity to reach Iowa, okay? And God has asked us to reach big Iowa. And this is big and it's, it, it's that, and, and we're all a part of this together. When you serve, when you pray, when you give, you know, we're, we're getting a chance to, to reach all over Iowa. Now, here's what I wanna make sure we all understand. While we're on this mission together, all of us, to reach big Iowa, okay? Every one of us, every one of us has a little Iowa that we're after. That's our own little circle of Iowa, our own little friends. And so all of us are involved in our little Iowas. Okay, that looks like Indiana, right? That's awful right there. We don't care about Indiana. We care about Iowa, okay? In fact, in three, three weeks, I'm going to go speak at a church in Indianapolis. So I'm sorry, I do care about Indiana, okay? But you see, oh, little Iowa and big Iowa, right? Big Iowa together, and you got your own little Iowa. So let's, let's keep after it together and let's make sure we're making a difference. Hey, so here's what we're doing. Um, we've been talking about how God has this big plan and how he, he's putting it in motion, how he put it in motion. So remember, we started way back in, in uh, Genesis, and we said, man, God created this thing, and it was just beautiful. And, and it was so beautiful, and everything was just right until sin entered in, and sin really became a, a disaster. But remember, as soon as that first sin happened, God's plan started in place. When God, the plan was started, the plan was started. When he said to the serpent, he said, he said the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And that was that first, that first picture of what's going to happen, that someday seed of the woman. Well, then we went to Abraham and we said, all right. So Abraham uh, was the promise and God promised. God made the covenant with Abraham. He said, Abraham, your seed, that seed of the woman, that seed's going to come through your line and your line is going to bring forth the Messiah. Your line is going to bless everybody. And so Jesus was predicted to come way back through Abe. 
And then last week, we spent all that time last week just on the law. You know, all those rules in the Old Testament, all that stuff you go through, and you're like, what is the stinking point of this? And the stinking point of the law is this, is that it shows us, you guys, it shows us how, how holy and righteous God is and how short we fall and what the demands are. If we're going to try to be on our own, how hard it is to try on your own to, to be perfect. And, and, and in fact, you can't. And so that, you guys, that, that takes us now kind of this one more spot, one more, one more place about this plan and how it was put in motion. We're going to go back to this big part of the Old Testament. And, and, and in fact, it's, it's not just part of the Old. It, it, it goes right into the New. We're going to talk about why in the world God had all this stuff in the Old Testament about blood and animal sacrifices. And why was it like that? I mean, I mean, this holy God who's really great and awesome, and we're, we're, we're kind of doing like animal sacrifices. And, and blood is mentioned 362 times in the Old Testament. And it's mentioned 90 sometimes in the New Testament. And so there's this big deal, and we have to understand why God did this. And what is it about that part of the plan that points us forward? Because listen, if we don't grasp this one, uh, we miss the big point, Okay. If we miss this one, then we're going to uh, really kind of be in trouble. So let's start with this, okay? Let's start with this. Um, there's this beginnings of the blood. So write that down first. There's going to be four or five kind of sections. So write this one down. We're going to start with this. There's the beginning of the blood that starts way back when this plan first came into motion. In fact, it, it's kind of one of those spots where you go, wow, if, if you're not really paying attention, you, you, you can miss it. And what we want to do is be absolutely sure that we grasp the importance of this kind of weird thing about blood and sacrifice that, that God put in place uh, way back from the beginning. So let, let's, let's go back to Genesis right now. Everybody just turn your Bible. First book of the Bible, all the way back. And go to Genesis 3. And we spent a little bit of time in here in the last couple of weeks. But I want you to kind of see something in here. So uh, to refresh, remember one and two is creation and God created it. And remember our idea is this. We want to kind of rise up to 10,000 feet so we, so we don't miss the big picture. The big picture of Genesis is, is, that, is that God did all this. God started all this. That God's plan was put in motion as soon as chapter 3 started. When sin came in, disaster happens. The plan was in motion. So everybody go to, to, to verse 7, okay, and, and look what it says. So Adam and Eve, they ate. They did what they weren't supposed to do. They kind of shook their fist at God and said, I know better than you. I know what's better for me than you know what's better for me, and I'm going to do what I want. Just take a time out just for a minute. Here's the crazy thing. Adam and Eve, the very first sin was doing this. I know better than you. I want to do things my way. And the crazy thing is that that's one of the <laughs> primal sins of the day, isn't it, for us? I want to do it my way. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. You can't tell me what to do, right? And that's just this, uh, this really deep rebellion. And that's sin. And you may be in that spot right now. You may be watching right now. And you may be your, that may be your attitude right now with God. I'll do what I want to do. My friends, just, just hear me out just for a second on this one. The God of the universe loves you so much that he had this big plan put in motion. You can't miss this plan. And if you want to keep banging your head against the wall that says, I want to do what I want to do, and you can't tell me what to do, you're going to have one sore head that's going to eventually end an eternity away from him. So if you're one of those banging your head right now, I'm asking you just to let down the guard just for a little bit, okay? Just let down the guard and say, okay, God, um, maybe I ought to listen to you even just a little. So, so go to, to Genesis 3, and, and the sin happens. And look at verse 7, and here's what it says. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. And, and, and so you kind of go, well, what's, the, what's the deal with that? Well, here's the deal with that. Before that moment, they had no idea that there was something to be um, weird about, that they had no idea that there was kind of comparisons and, and, and hiding and shaming, and they had none of that because that's what sin does. And, and, and sin kind of, all of a sudden, the sin comes in, and all of a sudden you go, whoa, 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 and your eyes get open to just this uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, dark side of things. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. As soon as it happened, all of a sudden they realized that, that something isn't right, that, that, that this is wrong, and they begin to feel things and, and be engulfed by things that they just hadn't been engulfed with before. That was sin. And, and, and so here's what it says they did. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings. Now look at this is key here. They made coverings for themselves. My friends, listen to me. Adam and Eve knew they were sinful, knew they had blown it. 
And so their immediate response was this, well, I got to cover for it. I've got to cover up. I've got to, I've got to make it right. I've got, to, I've got to put a covering on this thing. And what Adam and Eve's first response is the exact first response that you and I usually have to sin. I've got to cover this. I can cover this. I can, I can put something over this and make it better. I can hide this. My friends, there's a whole bunch of us spend a lot of our time trying to hide from God and hide from each other. And here's Adam and Eve. They said, I can cover this myself. And then the rest of the Old Testament is showing them that they can't cover it themselves. In fact, God steps in almost immediately. And so, so skip over to verse 20, if you would. And it said, Adam named his wife Eve, and because she would become the mother of all the living. And listen to what it says in 21. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. So right away, here we have this picture of what God's doing. God took some animals, and he sacrificed them. God killed these animals. And he made a covering for his people. And we have the very earliest signs of the cost to have your sin covered. The first sign of how much it's going to cost. I mean, these were living creatures that had lifeblood in them. And God killed them, shedding that blood so they could be covered of their sin. And so this is the beginnings of this blood. This is the beginnings of the, of the covering. In fact, you flip over to, to chapter 4, you, you'll see that we're, we're, we're kind of into this spot. And, and it says, now Abel, in verse 2, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked on favor with Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he didn't look with favor because here's what happens. We're already, we're seeing this beginnings of this idea that it's going to cost to be right with God. It's going to be cost to say, God, I'm on your side. God, I'm with you. There's a cost to it. And so already at the very beginning, after the first sin, while the first sin is still in the air, we're getting this little picture already that the plan's in motion that, hey, if you're going to cover, you're never going to be able to cover yourself. God has to cover you. And it's going to be a costly cover that's going to cost blood. And that's the beginnings, and that's how it starts. So, so let, let's, let's, let's go another step, and let's move to this spot now. So then the next phase is kind of this promise in the blood. So, so we have the beginnings of the blood, then we move to this, this, this promise in the blood. And, and, and what we see is, is all over the Abraham story. So after Noah and the flood and all the disaster, here comes Abraham. And remember what God comes into Abraham. He says, Abraham, here's, here's what's going to happen. I'm promising you, Abraham, here's my promise, that through you, Abraham, here's the seed, and your seed is going to bless everybody. Everybody. Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come through your line. Everybody just go to Genesis 12. Just flip over a couple pages. And remember, what, remember the promise. Remember the covenant that God made. So, so here it is in chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go and, and from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And, then, and here's the quote from God. Here's the covenant. Here's the promise that God made. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And so there's the promise. That's the, the covenant promise that God made with Abraham, that through you, Abraham, everybody's going to have a chance. Through you, Abraham, every nation is going to be blessed. But the problem was, if you remember, Abraham and his wife couldn't have any kids. They were already too old to have kids. But God said, you trust me. I'm gonna, I promise, and when I promise, I, I, I keep my promise. And for God, the covenant, the promise for God was a huge deal. It wasn't taken lightly. Today, we make promises all the time, and we break promises all the time. We have all kinds of loopholes that we try to get out of. But back in this day, you didn't get out of these promises. Here was the common practice in Abraham's day, okay? Common practice was this. If you and me were going to make a pact together, I was going to promise something to you, we would mark the gravity of the covenant. We would mark the gravity of that promise with an animal sacrifice, what, what, the most costly that we can have. And so what we would do was this. We'd take an animal, we'd, we'd drain the, kill it, drain the lifeblood out of it. We'd cut the animal in half. We'd put one half here and one half here. And then you and me, making a promise, we'd grab hands, and we would walk between the two halves of the animal, signifying this, that if I break this promise, may this be me. Pretty grave. Pretty serious. Turn over to 
chapter 15. <laughs> I want you to see this. So from the time of the first promise in 12, all kinds of years have passed now, and they don't have a baby yet. God comes back in chapter 15, and here he says to Abram, he says, um, you're going to be a blessing. Um, through your line, you are going to be a blessing. And God says, I'm going to do this. And, 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 and so God says to Abraham, go get, go get some animals, and, and we're going we're gonna to make this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to promise with you, Abraham. So he goes to what Abraham knows. And, the, and listen to this. As, as the sun was setting, verse 12 of Genesis 15, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own. And they'll be enslaved and mistreated there. And that's, so that's this prophecy that's going to come, that the Egyptians are going to enslave them. And Moses, 400 years from this point, Moses is going to come and say, let my people, that's, so that's the promise. 400 years before it happens, God says, here's what's going to happen. Then he says, but I'll, but, 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 uh, then he says in 14, but, but I'll punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they'll come out with great possessions. So we know the story. You, whoever, will, will go, at a, go, go down to your ancestors in peace and will be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So look at 17 now and follow this. So when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. In other words, this is a, 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 a semblance of God for, for Abraham. God in this form. Smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, here it is again. So you see this? This sacrifice stuff was, was huge. This blood and animal sacrifice was the most costly one you can do. And here's what God said. The beginnings of it, God showed us that there's going to be a covering and the covering is going to be costly. And then God said, I'm going to keep my promise. I'm so solemn in this promise that, that I'm, going to, I'm going to show you how serious I am about this. And, 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 and so, so God was going to, going to keep the promise, and the way he signified the gravity of keeping the promise was how much it was going to cost. The blood sacrifice, the blood was the symbol of how serious God is, which leads us kind of to this next step of the plan. Because what we learn is this, that for anybody's sins to be forgiven, for them to be right with God, God put a, a system in place for them. And here was the price. The price for forgiveness is blood. The price is blood. My friends, this is started way back from the beginning. And you may think, ah, oh, what's with all the blood stuff? And why, why, is, why is it happening like this? And, and here's why it's happening like this. Because God said, I want you to know how much it's going to cost for you to be right with me. I want to know how much it's going to cost for your sin to be made clean. I want you to know and what better way for you to know than if it costs the lifeblood of something. The whole Old Testament, it beats with this plan. And here was this plan was leading to, that was leading to this, that the great sacrifice that was to come. And God wanted them to know that for them to be free and for them to be righteous, for them to be forgiven, here's what it cost. Blood. Everybody turn to Leviticus, if you would. It's the third book in. Go to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Go to Leviticus chapter 1. And Leviticus chapter 1. Now, this is Leviticus is just really serious flyover country in Scripture, right? Nobody wants to read Leviticus. But, man, I'm telling you right now, once you get this bigger picture, you're going to read it differently, Okay? Once you start to see it from this 10,000 foot, and you start to go, wow, what was the point? What was the purpose? But look what happened. Start in Leviticus 1 and just kind of thumb through the first seven chapters. And God, the first seven chapters says, here's the offerings that you need to make to be right with me and to be right with others. Here's the offerings that you need to make. There's guilt offering and sin offering and grain offering and burnt offering and peace offering, fellowship offering. And, and, and then the rest of Leviticus is, is how this is all supposed to work and what it's going to cost. And, and if you're going to stay in a right relationship. So if you want to be right with God, here's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost the lifeblood of something. It's going to cost that. So every time somebody would sin, here's what would happen. They'd have to offer something to cover for their sin. And the only thing they could cover for their sin was something that God would give them, which would be the lifeblood of an animal. So the only way they could be covered is if blood would cover them. And so that's why all of Leviticus and all that Old Testament stuff about they would sprinkle the blood, and they'd sacrifice this way, and they'd burn this way, and they'd do it like this. All of it was designed for this one purpose so that the people could see 
And if you're going to be right with God, he is so loving and so holy and so perfect, and he so desires a relationship that he created us, and he so wants the, the, the sin to be removed between us that God gives, us, gives them a way to do it. They could cover their sin with a blood sacrifice. And that's the only way that they could be in right relationship with God. So rather than being weird and crazy, rather than being like this stupid Old Testament stuff, we begin to see that God was just showing them. And this whole Old Testament was pointing. Remember the heartbeat, the whole Old Testament kept, kept pointing forward. In fact, if you, if you would, just in Leviticus, flip over to chapter 17. And, and he kind of gives this statement, kind of after he gives a bunch of rules and regulations and showing kind of how high the standard is. He, he, he goes down to go down to about verse 10. He's talking about eating blood, being, that, that's stuff that they shouldn't do. And then he says this, in verse 10 he says, I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood, and I will cut them off from their people. Because he's wanting them to know this blood thing is serious. Hey, this isn't something that we do. And look what he says in 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And so God is just setting this baby up, and he's setting it up for this new picture of Jesus. And so some of the requirements of the Old Testament were this. If you were going to sacrifice an animal according to the law and the regulation, if you were going to do it to, to cover your sin or to, to, to cover up for what you've done, to, to appease God, to make you right with God, here's what would happen. You'd have to have a spotless, perfect animal. So you couldn't just get the weak one from the flock. You couldn't pull back the last one who's almost ready to die and say, okay, this is the good one. God says, you give me your first, the best, because this is costly to be right with me. And, 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 and the person offering had to identify with the animal. The person had to have, a, have this, have the, it's his mind. This was costly to me. It wasn't somebody else doing this, it was me. And the person doing it had to be the one who, who killed the animal because, because this is the way that it, need to, it needed to work. And I know some people go, yeah, but, but why the animals? They're so innocent. Why? Why would you do that? My friends, the animal being innocent is the point. The animal was substituting for their own blood. Instead of them having to pay, God provided this substitute animal to pay. New Testament with me real quickly, okay? Go all the way up to the book of 2 Corinthians. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four. Then you get Acts, Romans. Then you get 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and, and 2 Corinthians 5 is just an awesome chapter. You know, Paul wrote this, this book, and he's writing to the Corinthians. And, and, and in 5, he really starts hitting this about being reconciled to God, being right with God. And verse 17 is where he says, there if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Some of you, you know that one. Look at verse 20. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf. And what's he imploring? We want you to be reconciled to God. How can someone? be reconciled or be right with God? Look at verse 21. Because God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this is all these animal sacrifices. They're leading, they're pointing up to this one point, this one place where this innocent Jesus, sinless and perfect, which the New Testament makes a big deal out, is the only one who can pay the ultimate price and cover all of our sins. He's the only one. And so every one of those animal sacrifices, all that blood and stuff of the Old Testament, was all part of the plan pointing to Jesus. But the problem with the Old Testament one was this, that when you had to sacrifice an animal to cover what you did, and you had to sprinkle the blood and follow all the rules and get yourself clean, it was only temporary. But with Jesus... When he came, it was a permanent solution 
not temporary. In the Old Testament, there had to be many sacrifices, right? You had to come on every festival, and every time you sinned, you had to pay for it, and it was just this constant, constant mode, this cycle that you just had to be in, and you could never keep up. It was many all the time, but with Jesus, it was one and done. It was Jesus. And the covering on on the Old Testament was this. It was only partial because you had to come back again. It didn't do it forever. But with Jesus, it was complete. My friends, I know all this Old Testament stuff can just be silly sometimes. And you go, why was it? God wants you and me to know. He wants us to know what the cost is. He wants to know what it's going to cost for you to be right with him. And this whole system of the Old Testament was pointing to one moment that would happen on Calvary. One moment when the final one would be sacrificed, whose blood would be shed. In the Old Testament, there's, a, there's one spot, okay, uh, that, that, just, that, that just foreshadows this whole picture. Let's go back to Exodus 12, okay? Everybody go back Old Testament to the second book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Go to Exodus 12. So, so Exodus 12 um, is, 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 the, is the story of the Passover, the Passover lamb. And, and I want you to read that this week and kind of kind of walk through it. But remember when this happened. This is that the, the, the slavery, they were in slavery for 400 years as God predicted. And they were, they were slaves to Egypt. And finally Moses comes and says, let my people go. And the plagues come. But the very last plague was this, that God would send. If Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go, here's what's going to happen. The firstborn in every household and the firstborn of every flock is going to die tonight if you, don't, if you don't let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I'm not going to do this. And so God sends an angel, an angel of death. It's going to come. But here's what he gives him. He gives him an out. He says, to you who believe, here's what I want you to do. And you can read this in chapter 12. Take a lamb. And here's what you need to do with the lamb. Three days before this is going to happen, you need to get this lamb. And for three days, you need to test this lamb and observe this lamb to make sure it's not crippled or has a defect or is sick. Because it's got to be perfect. It's got to be a perfect sacrifice. And then on the eve of Passover... You need to take that lamb and you need to sacrifice that lamb. You need to drain its lifeblood. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that blood and I want you to smear the blood on the doorposts of your house. And if you smear the blood on the doorposts of your house, the angel will remember to pass over you and he won't kill anybody in your house. You will escape death. And so that was what happened. And if you look at it, go everybody, everybody look over to verse 12. And here's what it says in, in, in Genesis, or Exodus 12, 12. On that same night, I'll pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now just listen to me. That was hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. But here's the picture. The blood is the picture. The sacrifice to be free and covered is the picture. So what did Jesus do? Jesus came into Jerusalem three days before Passover Eve. What did Jesus do? For three days, Pilate and the others tested him and observed him, watched him, and he didn't fail. And on Passover Eve, Jesus was crucified. And just as God said, I'll remember, what did Jesus say? You drink this cup and you eat this bread and you remember what I've done. My friends, listen, I know this. The Old Testament's a long ways away. And it's a culture and it's a people that's just, it's a long ways from us. But you need to know this, that God had a plan. And his plan wasn't just for those people now, back then or those people someday, but for these people, you and me today, that our sin could be forgiven, that we could be made clean that the standard of God could be met, and it was in Jesus. And so very simply, here's what you need to know. That when Jesus died on the cross, 
the last things that he said is this. It is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about the old system where you had to do it. That's finished now. Jesus did it. And if you want to be right with God, if you want to be forgiven for your sin, it's not be a good person, it's not go to church, it's not be religious, it's not quit cussing, it's none of those things. If you want to be right with God, you need to see that Jesus died for you, that he paid the price, that he sacrificed, that the plan was in place, that someday you and me would get covered by the blood. And your option is this, that you step over the line and you trust him. That's your option. And if you trust Christ for your forgiveness, you can have peace with God. You can be free to be the woman or the man that God has called you to be. You can quit worrying about your future because he's got it. You can quit worrying about your past because he's covered it. And you can live with God today. My friends, if you haven't made that decision, I am imploring you. God put a plan in place and he advertised the plan to us. He showed it. And then he fulfilled it. If you don't know this, Jesus, if you haven't accepted what he's done, maybe, maybe today's the day. Maybe today is the day. So let's pray, all of us. Close your Bibles up. We're going to move to communion in just a little bit. Your campus pastor is going to come up in just a second. But let me, let me just pray for all of us, okay? Just take a deep breath with me, even if you're at home right now. Just take a moment in your own words, in your own heart. Thank God for the plan. Thank him that he put it in motion. And that he loves you so much that Jesus completed the plan so we could be free. Just thank him for that. And if you're in that spot right now where you're not sure where you stand with him, this is the moment that you just surrender and you finally say, okay, I'm done fighting. I'm done banging my head against the wall. I'm done trying to earn my way. Jesus, I trust you. If you need to make that decision, make it now. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. I trust you. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful for the plan. So grateful that you put it in motion. And thank you that our sin, which is great, has been covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. In his name, all of us, we pray together. Amen. Amen.